Thank you, Adam. Everybody hear me okay? We having a good morning so far? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, good morning? Good? All right. Uh, so thank you for the nice introduction, Adam. Uh, that's who I am. Uh, who the heck is Sandler Training? Well, Sandler Training is the largest sales and sales management based training organization uh, in the world by far, uh, but we're also franchise based. So our local franchise that I've been a part of for the last three years is located in Golden Valley. Um, and prior to jumping on board and becoming a team member, I was a client for three full years, all right? So Sandler Training is this big, huge ele elephant of sales knowledge and sales techniques and everything like that. Uh, today, we're gonna really focus on kind of the high points, all right? Uh, but one of, the, one of the viewpoints that we have is that behavioral change really takes time and you have to go from knowing something like this to actually owning it before uh, it becomes habit. So before we jump in, um, I just want to share some core principles uh, from Sandler that really coincide with what Adam mentioned uh, in my little bio there. One of which is understanding that the sales profession or our role as salespeople within our professions, it's, it's a noble profession and, and we have rights as salespeople and there's really no place in the world for a desperate subservient salesperson that's trying to show up and throw up and just vomit and feature benefit dump everything that we have, all right? It's understanding that our worth as a sales professional or our worth in our roles as salespeople within our, within our careers, it's based a lot more upon our ability to gather valuable information from the people we're speaking to rather than our ability to give information in this big dog and pony show type of fashion. If you look at it big, big, big picture, sales is really the product of asking the right questions of the right people at the right time, all right? So we're gonna get into that a little bit today. Uh, we'll do a review of, of the Sandler selling system and everything along those lines. So sit back, uh, relax, get comfortable because this is gonna be the longest 60 minutes uh, of your lives. <laughs> Just kidding, that's not the case at all. I've got some goals today, uh, one of which is to try and make this as interactive as possible. It's not meant to be me dumping on you for 60 minutes. If you have questions, please feel, feel brave volunteer and jump in. Uh, you can either just straight up cut me off or you can raise your hand, um, but the more interactive this can be, the better. Um, I may even call on people uh, occasionally, so just be uh, prepared. Fair? All right. So we're gonna start with really what we call the Sandler success triangles. Uh, this is a version of the Sandler success triangles. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise in our personal lives. There's a lot of noise in our professional lives. There's a lot of junk, a lot of garbage that we can't control. We really can't control at all. And we believe at Sandler that there's three main things in life, but especially in our profession that we can control. And those three things are our behavior, our attitude, and our technique, all right? So if you look at the attitude portion of it, understanding what is our attitude towards ourselves, what is our attitude towards the organization that we work for or that we're a part of? And what is our attitude towards the general industry or marketplace that we're in? And understanding that our subconscious attitude will come through, our conscious attitude will come through subconsciously in our communication efforts. Whether it's good or bad, that attitude is gonna show through, all right? If you look at the behavior piece, obviously behavior are the things that we choose to do each and every day, but within that, it's understanding goals, plans, and actions. What goals do we have? What do we have for short-term goals? What do we have for long-term goals? What do we have for daily goals for that particular day? And then what is our plan to actually achieve those goals? All right, How, what is our plan to achieve those goals? And then really fine-tuning that plan as we gut check ourselves a month down the line on a yearly plan, a quarter down the line on a yearly plan, do we need to fine-tune that plan? Do we have the guts and the discipline to actually execute on that plan, all right? So that's the attitude, that's the behavior. Our technique is really what is our strategy? What's our personal presence? What are some of the tactics that we can utilize as we drive forward and push on as to what we're trying to accomplish, okay? All right, here's the first, um, here's the first uh, involvement, I guess. You have to choose one, and just by a show of hands, if you look at the sales profession or sales in general, show of hands, if you believe 
I'm going to ask for art and science. And if you believe that sales is more of an art than it is a science, raise your hand. If you think sales is an art, raise your hand. Okay, we got a handful of people. Anybody that had their hand up want to make a case for why sales is an art versus a science? Anybody? I can get you started. Maybe it's because we got to be, you know, socially charismatic and we got to be a people person and we got to really be able to influence people. Fair? Is that anything else that anybody wants to add from the art standpoint? You got to be able to, you know, figure people out just from asking a few questions what, you know, might interest them more. You know. I love it. Thank you for volunteering. He said it's more about being able to figure people out how they tick, asking questions, and kind of being able to, to maneuver and navigate. Okay, if you didn't have your hand up for art, science. Who believes sales is more of a science? All right, somebody from a science standpoint, make your case. With, with enough data, you know what people are objecting to more than that. Okay, science is data. Good, go ahead back there. Yeah, we're creatures of habit, you know, we tend to operate the same way consistently. You know, science by nature is a process. Go ahead. I think they're both together. They work together. It's not just one or the other. It can't be. Okay, so that's where we're going to transition because you're absolutely right. Obviously, it's both, all right? Our belief at Sandler is that it's slightly more a science than it is an art. Call it 60-40, maybe 55-45, but we need to be artful in our utilization of the science. And we're going to spend, you know, the next 52 minutes here on the science portion of it for the most part, but they coincide and they interact uh, with one another, okay? So we've got the Sandler submarine, also known as the Sandler selling system. If you look at sales in, gen in general, whether it's the Sandler selling system or some other selling system, it really comes down to three big points establishing and maintaining the, the relationship, qualifying the opportunity or discovering the opportunity, and then closing the sale, all right? Those are really the three broad-based things with any, within any sales. Uh, but from a Sandler standpoint, we break it down into seven areas. And if you look at bonding and rapport, upfront contracting, paying budget decision, fulfillment, and post-sell, those are the seven steps, all right? If we look at establishing and maintaining the relationship, that's where bonding and rapport and upfront contracting come in. Obviously, each and every single interaction we have with a prospect or a customer, we're focused on bonding and building rapport. It's not something that we just do once in our first interaction and we have it and, and we're good to go. No, we need to continually do that. Same with upfront contracting. What do I mean by upfront contracting? Setting and managing expectations. Setting and managing expectations, laying the ground rules for the relationship. And by doing so, we can lower defense walls and really create mutual agreements upon what's going to happen and things along those lines. So that's establishing and maintaining the relationship. If we get into pain, budget, and decision, all right, pain, budget, and decision, that's qualifying the opportunity, all right, qualifying the opportunity and understanding that our prospects really need to earn the right for a proposal from us. And we're not just boiling up a pot of wet noodles, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, all right? We can control this process and we can really put ourselves in a good position to win business consistently, all right? And then you get into fulfillment, which is really just delivery, proposal, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then post-sell is eliminating buyer's remorse um, and really setting the stage for what kind of relationship you're going to have moving forward, all right? So big picture within Sandler, what we consistently talk about is qualifying the opportunity hard so that we can close easy at the end. Qualify hard so that when it comes time to close, it's not this big event that takes place, all right? Buyers have systems, whether it's conscious or subconscious, and there's a traditional selling approach that buyers are aware of and they understand it and all these old tired closing techniques, they, they see them coming, it makes them uncomfortable. Ultimately, it puts too much pressure on us and the prospect if we wait until you know, the very end to try and close the opportunity. We need, through qualifying the opportunity, we can set ourselves up to close a lot easier. 
Anybody think about that? So when I say qualify hard to close easy, how does that hit you? Any gut takeaways, immediate reactions to that? What do I mean by qualify the opportunity? Yeah, what is the need, okay? What is the need? And that's what we're talking about here. It's more about understanding what their needs are, what their challenges are, all right? Instead of showing up and telling them why they should buy from us, why our product is better, we need to ask questions to help them uncover what their challenges are. And not just the surface level challenges, but what the impacts of those challenges are on them, all right? We're gonna get into that a little bit more, more uh, we're gonna get into that more in a little bit here. But there's a term that we use at Sandler and it's called watch out for happy ears. Watch out for happy ears. What do I mean by happy ears? Well, sometimes we hear things from the people that we're trying to sell to that we interpret to be a lot more positive than they actually are, okay? Something like, hey, things look good. Send me a quote, but things look good. I'm really excited about this opportunity. Hey, I'm just waiting on a couple more quotes, but you know, it looks like you're, it looks like you're the front runner. You know, I'll get back to you in a week or I'll get back to you in a month. All right. We got to watch out for happy years and we really got to clarify what that means. When you say things look good, can you help me understand what that means? Okay. When you say you want to get a quote from me, uh, help me understand why is it that you want that quote? Help me understand why is it that you're so excited about this opportunity? And we got to avoid rushing to close too quickly. All right. Sometimes people come to us and they say, Hey, what do you got? And we say, well, we have this. And they say, wow, that's awesome. It's like, okay, well, do you want to buy it? Let's slow down. Let's not rush to close. Let's really help them uncover what those challenges are, what those pain points are and what the impacts of those pain points are. Tie that into the investment or the budget conversation. And then we got to understand their decision-making dynamics. All right, the people that are gonna be involved as they make a decision. What process are they gonna go through in making that decision? And are we okay with that process? Does that prospect work for us? Does that process work for us? Or is that process gonna put us in a situation where we're trying to follow up, we're trying to chase them down, we're trying to track them down, and we don't hear from, from them for a month, okay? And what criteria, what criteria is important to them? People process and criteria. Are they solely going to be making their purchase based on price or what else is a factor? All right. So big, 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 big picture. It's all about gathering information. We want to gather as much critical information as we can before we give information all too often in the sales profession. What comes natural is we get excited, we're in front of somebody and we just start dumping and we start giving all of the information that we have. If we look at our role within our businesses as a salesperson and we look at the information, what is our information, big picture, in relation to the conversation? What is the information that we have? What is the knowledge that we have? How, how would you define that as it relates to that big picture concept? Maybe it's our leverage. All of our information, all of our quotes, all of our knowledge, that's our leverage, all right? And as soon as we give them all of the information we have, we don't have any more leverage. And they can take that information, quotes, proposals, and then they can give it to your competitor, they can give it to their current provider and say, hey, can you do this, all right? So we gotta avoid that situation by really trying to understand what's going on before presenting and, 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 and delivering. I'm going to slow down and pause. Any questions up to this point before we keep it moving? Any questions? When you say gather information, can that also be like finding a need? Because I like to think of it as finding a need and then filling that need with our services or product or whatever. 100%, I mean finding a need. Now, can you say that one more time louder? Finding a need and then doing what? Okay. Okay. So we definitely want to find that need. And once we find that need, then we need to dig into that need. And we're going to get into this, but we really need to understand, okay, what is the impact of that need? 
not having that or that need or problem, how is that impacting the person? So when I say don't rush to close too quickly, we find a need rather than jumping in and solving that problem immediately, we got to slow down, ask some more questions, figure out are there other needs and really gather all of that information so we get the full scope of what's going on before we make our case, before we present, before we propose. Okay? Is that Yeah, so they don't realize that they need us. And our job as a salespeople is to help people uncover what their reasons are for buying, all right? And we do that through asking questions. We do that through gathering information, all right? So if we look at the Sandler summary, Summarine again, bonding and rapport, upfront contract, pain, budget, decision, fulfillment, and post-sell, we're gonna break down each one of these, at least the first five, all right? So bonding and rapport, what comes to mind when you think of bonding and rapport? Skip past this, but when you think of bonding and rapport and interactions that you have as a sales professional, what comes to mind? How do we typically bond and build rapport? What do we, what's that? Yeah, we relate to them in, in, in what fashion? What do we relate to them in? Common interests? Yeah, so what are some common interests that we just talked about? What, what kind of chit chat do we have? Personal rapport. Per, personal rapport, okay. Common interests, family, kids, sports, weather, or maybe it's traffic, all right? Any, if we're trying to genuinely bond and build rapport and increase our relationship with somebody, anybody see any issue with, with talking about the weather or common interests or anything like that for somebody that we just met or somebody that is out there? Any, any, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm definitely not saying don't do that because you can move the needle there, but go ahead, Adam. It's too easy, you gotta be a little bit more personal, love it. Anybody else, what other potential issues could there be with that? I think it depends on the personality type. If you got like an IV on the fifth thing, on the tip, uh, start, they could care less about chit-chat. You guys know DISC? Do, does everybody know DISC or just you? DISC, okay, DISC is fantastic. That's a little bit of what we're gonna talk about. You're right, basically, it can come across as extremely disingenuine. If we're talking about the weather, everybody talks about the weather. Who gives a rip? When, we, when the first thing we bring up is the weather, it's clear that that's our effort for some level of bonding and rapport. Above the surface, easy to see bonding and rapport. Sure, it's comfortable, sure it's easy, but if we start asking about their kids or their family or things like that, it can come across as extremely disingenuine. Now, if they bring it up, go ahead and roll with it, but it's a little bit disingenuine. What we're talking about from a bonding and rapport standpoint, bonding and rapport is like an iceberg. It's like a big, huge iceberg where 15% is above the surface and you can see it. And the other 75, 85% is below the surface. We wanna focus on the below the surface bonding and rapport. Above the surface is things like the weather, common interests, sports, family, things like that. All right, so below the surface, let's start with the middle one, elements of communication. This is not a Sandler specific thing. This comes from a study from UCLA back in the 60s. But if you look at communication in a pie chart, and if you had 100% of that pie chart, there's really three, three ways that we communicate. Body language, tonality, and then the actual words that we use. So if you look at those three things, which one makes up the largest portion of the pie, would you say? Body language. And what percentage, that's right, that's correct, what percentage of that 100 would you say comes from body language? 50, anybody else? 70, okay. 55%, 55% of our ability to communicate effectively comes from body language, all right? So we need to understand what is our body language? What type of message are we portraying with our body language? And then you've got tonality and spoken words. So we've got 45% left. What's next? What other one is, is the lar second largest of our ability to communicate effectively? Tonality is correct. And what percentage would you say is tonality? 25, any other guesses? 38%. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. I have flashbacks, you know, thinking about growing up with my mom, or I have flashbacks about last night with my girlfriend, and it's like, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. All right, so what is our tonality? 
And then the spoken words comes down to 7%. The actual spoken words that we use is really only 7% of our ability to communicate. So elements of communication, well, how can we use this to our advantage? It comes down to mirroring and matching. We want to mirror and match the body language and the tonality of the people that we're talking to and trying to sell to, all right? Let's look at, let's look at uh, tonality, for example. If we've got somebody who is a very soft speaker and they tend to speak a little bit slowly, we don't want to jump in there large and in charge and talking a mile a minute. We need to check ourselves, slow down, and match their tonality, match their rate of speech. On the other hand, if we have somebody who's large and in charge and they're really moving, they're gonna be extremely uncomfortable if we're a soft talker and we can't even get the words out and we're just going really slow. No, we've gotta mirror and match their tonality and their body language, and that's bonding, that's building rapport, that's below the surface. People like people who are like themselves. And when we say like themselves, it's matching like that. People tend to trust people that they like. And then ultimately, big picture, people buy from people that they trust. Did you have a question? I did. So this is kind of like more of a, since body language is such a big part of how we communicate, well, sometimes we do a lot, a lot of our sales are done through the phone. Yeah. How, how do you feel that 55% is? It matters. It matters big time. And it matters in the sense that our body language is going to have an indication on our ability to communicate. So if we're on the phone and we're sitting at our desk and we're all hunched over like this, you know, our communication actually isn't going to come through as well. All right. What we do, what we teach, what we train on is if you are making cold calls or talking to people, stand up, walk around, move around the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for here. The residual effect of that is that the energy and power behind your actual verbal communication is enhanced heavily. All right. Think about if you're laying down on the couch, how much different that conversation is going to be if you're standing up, walking around and things like that, for sure. But it's a good point. You know, so we really, really need to focus on our tonality when it comes to being over the phone, for sure. Any other questions? All right, we got to keep moving. Upfront contracting. Upfront contracting. Disappointment in life really comes from two things. Expectations not being met and un unrealistic expectations being set in the first place, all right? Expectations not being met and unrealistic expectations being set in the first place. So with upfront contracting, big picture what we're talking about is we are setting and managing expectations for what's gonna happen in this conversation that we're about to have, what's gonna happen in future interactions that we're gonna have, and creating mutual agreement and mutual buy-in as to what's going to happen and what we're going to discuss in this conversation as we move forward. A clear, well understood, mutually agreed upon future. All right. We're going to get into how we can do that and some specific ways of doing that. All right. But really it's laying the ground rules for the relationship. Remember I said sales is a noble, noble profession and we have rights as a salesperson. One of the ways to really establish equal business stature and not be subservient is through really good, strong, consistent usage, of upfront contracts. Now, if I was you, I'd be thinking to myself, what the hell is an upfront contract? Like that doesn't make any sense. We'll get into it here a little bit. All right. But this is each and every single interaction that we have with somebody. We're setting some form of an upfront contract. And there's a lot of different forms of upfront contracting. We're going to start with one of the more simple ones that are, that's easiest to implement. But why do we want to do that? People do want to be led. People do want to be led and they really want to be told how and what is going to happen. And by doing so, when everything is, is explained up front, well, then they become more comfortable. Then their defense walls come down. All right. Then we're not some snake oil salesperson that's trying to sell them on it, but we're really there to have an adult to adult open conversation. And through this open conversation collectively will determine does it make sense to work together or does it not make sense to work together? And me as a salesperson, I'm okay if it doesn't make sense for us to work together, but I'm not okay with us not even having an open conversation about, Hey, does it make sense or does it not make sense? Okay. So there's really five elements of an upfront contract, time, purpose, their role or agenda, our role or agenda and outcomes. 
five elements. If I was you, I would jot these down. Time, purpose, their agenda, our agenda, outcomes. How much time do we have for this interaction? Is this gonna be a 10 minute conversation? Is this gonna be a 90 minute conversation, all right? And making sure that everybody's on the same page in that. Anybody ever had a prospect come in or they're talking to somebody and we think that we've got 30 minutes and five minutes into the conversation they say, hey, I gotta run, I don't really have time or, or something along those lines. Anybody ever been in a situation where, where time was misunderstood? Got at least one person, all right, good. So getting agreement on how much time we have. Sometimes prospects think that, hey, this salesperson is gonna dump on me for 60 minutes here, and I don't wanna listen to the salesperson for 60 minutes, all right? So we can share with them, hey, you know, I, I was thinking we had 30 minutes here. Is, do you have 30 minutes? Are you free for the next 30 minutes for us to have an open discussion? Yeah. Well, then we can get into the purpose. You know, I think the purpose of our conversation today really is to ask each other a bunch of questions. I could learn more about what's going on, um, what challenges you're faced with. You can ask me any question you want to about, you know, our services, our products and things like that. Okay. So purpose. The purpose is for us to ask each other a bunch of questions. All right. Their agenda and expectations. Well, what do they want to discuss? We've now agreed that we've got 30 minutes together. You know, Mr. Prospect, what will we have discussed for you to feel like this 30 minutes was a productive usage of time? Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. You know, uh, we'll definitely discuss that. In addition to that, I was really hoping to ask you some questions about this, that, and the other thing. Are you okay if I ask you questions about those areas? Yes, that's fine. Okay. And you know, usually Mr. Prospect, by the end of these 30 minutes, uh, a couple different things can happen. One of which is that we agree that you know what, it does make sense for us to have a further conversation. If that's the case, we'll figure out when and where we're going to have that conversation. On the other hand, you know, you or me might determine, hey, this isn't going to be a good fit. If that's the case, you're comfortable being direct with me and telling me that? I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely. And you could say, now on the other side of that, I might determine that, you know what, you're not a good fit for us either. And if that's the case, are you comfortable with me sharing that with you? Okay, so if we go through that and phrase things that way in a nurturing fashion, what happens? Think about that interaction taking place. What can happen when we kind of phrase something like that, especially the outcomes portion of it? Louder? So there's no misunderstanding again. There's no misunderstanding, for sure. What else? What else? Yeah, we've got clear expectations. We can further that rapport. When we say something like, hey, look, at the end of this discussion, one of two things is gonna happen. Either it's gonna be obvious that we need to have further discussions and we'll figure out what those look like, or one of us is gonna determine that this isn't a good fit. If you determine that this isn't a good fit, are you comfortable skipping the Minnesota nice or Midwest nice and being direct with me and telling me that so that we can save both of our times? And on the other side of that, you know, if I feel like this isn't a good fit, are you comfortable with me being direct and telling you that? What happens to their defense walls when we say something like that? Louder? Yeah, they come down. So we talked about wanting to ensure that we have open, honest dialogue to collectively determine, hey, does this make sense? Well, if you want somebody to open up and really share with you what's going on within their business, what needs they have, what challenges they have, share with them that, hey, if this isn't a good fit, tell me that it's not a good fit give them that out before the conversation even happens because then they'll lower their defense walls and they'll actually open up and have a conversation. All right. We want to eliminate mutual mystification. Anybody got, want to take a stab at what the heck mutual mystification is? Go ahead, Adam. Mutual mystification is confusing. And when you say it sounds confusing, maybe both, take it. Both parties don't understand what's happening. Both parties don't understand what's happening. So think about your business and the interactions that you have. What could be an example of mutual mystification? What's that? <laughs> there you go. Great example. Are you going to brush every time? For sure. What else? How about... Hey, why don't you send me some quotes and I'll get back to you in a week or two. That's mutual mystification. Something else you wanted to share? 
What does a couple weeks mean? I mean, a couple weeks means what? Does, to, to a lot of people, that could be a couple months. You know, it says in the Bible that you can lie to a salesperson and still go to heaven, all right? We, that's not part of our role as salespeople at all, all right? We need to get out in front of that and ensure that they know, hey, it's not okay, all right? I have rights as a salesperson. I have rights over here as well. Let's agree on what's going to happen and make sure everybody's okay with that. Yeah, in a nurturing fashion, in a nurturing fashion and ask, so we can ask permission to say things like that. Hey, Mr. Prospect, really appreciate what you're sharing with me. Would it be okay if I shared something with you? Would it be okay if I shared something with you? And there's a hundred percent yes rate to that question. You could say, hey, well, you know, one of the concerns that I have is that if we don't get this dialed in within this specific timeline that I think we agreed upon, well, what could happen is that your spot gets filled. And if your spot gets filled, you know, I don't know what's going to happen after that. Maybe collectively we could determine what we can do to avoid that from happening. For sure. Okay. So that's upfront contracting in big picture, but ANOT, ANOT is a specific strategy or acronym that you can remember to start utilizing and implementing upfront contracts. All right. ANOT stands for appreciate naturally obviously and typically now there's many different other kinds of upfront contracts all right we could spend five hours talking about upfront contracts alone but this is the first one that we start with i'll just do a quick little role play on air for what a not sounds like you know what jim really appreciate you coming in today i'm excited about these 30 minutes that we have together really appreciate you coming in you know jim i think the purpose is really for us to ask each other a bunch of questions and learn more about one another Naturally, Jim, you're gonna have all kinds of questions for me about my organization, what we're capable of and things like that. Jim, I want you to feel comfortable asking me anything you wanna know, okay? Now, obviously, Jim, I've got some questions for you, all right? My questions are really gonna be geared around, you know, what challenges you're currently seeing with your current setup. Uh, my questions are gonna be centered around, you know, what you're hoping you'll be able to accomplish by moving forward. Jim, are you okay if I ask you questions in those areas? 100% of the time he's gonna say yes, okay. You can ask me questions about that. And Jim, by the way, typically by the end of these 30 minutes, one of two things happens. Either it's pretty obvious that we need to have a further discussion, it's pretty obvious that we need to set something else up for a demo or something like that, okay? So if that's the case, at the very end of this conversation, we'll get that set up and we'll, we'll discuss what that looks like. On the other hand, it's possible that you or me determine, you know what, there just isn't a good fit here. Jim, if you're feeling like there's not a good fit, are you comfortable skipping the Minnesota nice, being direct with me and sharing that that's the case? 100% of the time, Jim is gonna say yes. And he's probably gonna chuckle a little bit and say, yeah, I got no problem being direct with you. Okay, great, thank you, Jim. Now on the other side of that, Jim, if I'm feeling like you know, you're not a great fit for us, are you comfortable with me being direct and sharing that with you as well? And then he'll go from laughing and being so positive about, yeah, I'll tell you to piss off if I need to. His backbone tightens up a little bit. And he's like, oh, I've got to earn the right to partner with these guys as well. Appreciate naturally, obviously, typically. All right. Naturally covers their agenda and what they want to bring up. Obviously covers our agenda and the things that we want to learn. Typically is focused on the outcome. Five elements of an upfront contract. Time that you have for the meeting. What's the purpose of the meeting? What's their agenda or what do they want to cover? What's our agenda and what do we want to cover? And then the outcome, potential outcomes. Okay. Shifting gears here a little bit. We're going to talk about the power of asking questions. Remember, we shared earlier that our worth as sales professionals is based upon our ability to gather information and not on our ability to give information in a dog and pony show fashion. So why should we ask questions? What's the benefit of asking questions? Well, here's the thing. People don't argue with their own data. People will argue with the salesperson that says, hey, this is better because of this. But if we can ask questions to help them understand why that would be a benefit, and then they share why it would be a benefit, they're not gonna argue with their own words, their own data, their own, own information. Genuine curiosity, being fully present in a conversation, all right? Genuine curiosity and being fully present in the conversation, 
that helps people realize that not only do you hear them and care about them, but you actually understand the situation that they're in, all right? Active listening, active listening goes back to bonding and rapport. I didn't spend any time on it on that first slide, I apologize. We're gonna spend some time on it now though. So if I suggest active listening, what does active listening mean to you? If you just think of active listening, if I'm actively listening, what does that mean? Go ahead, Adam. Um, you're having eye contact and 100% eye contact is definitely a part of it. What else? Taking note, of what they're Taking note on what they're saying instead of just kind of blowing past and thinking about what we're going to ask them next. Now, if you think about it, how could we take note of what they're saying? If we're not actually taking note, how could we verbally communicate with them that we're taking note of what they're sharing with us? Body language. Body language for sure. Go ahead. Ask them a question about some statement they just made. Yeah, so let's, let's kind of take that path. Ask them a question about a statement they just made. So active listening, there's really two main ways we can go about it. One is through generally paraphrasing what they shared with us. So if they share a whole bunch of information, we could say, you know what, Jim, would it be okay if I took two to three minutes to, to, to summarize what I think I heard from you? Because ultimately I want to make sure I understand what I heard from you. So would it be okay if I summarized and kind of, you know, shared with you what I think I heard? And then you can put it back out to them. What's the benefit of them hearing their own words through a summarization that we give them? It builds rapport, trust, they know that we're listening, all right? People here, if they're sharing with us a bunch of needs and challenges and problems that they have, it's one thing for them to share it, it's another thing for them to hear their own words back again. So they're reliving those challenges and reliving those pains. The other way is to just straight up restate what they said. So paraphrasing and restating, two main active listening techniques, all right? Summarizing and restating it back to them. And it really ultimately shows that we understand and care, in a big picture, it builds trust, okay? I talked about some of this stuff. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. People don't care what you know about cleaning vehicles or anything like that until they know that you care about their particular situation, all right? And it's much more important to be interested than it is to be interesting. It's much more important to be interested in them and their particular situation than it is to be the proverbial one-upper or the person that's kind of a know-it-all or the person that has answers for everything, all right? Show genuine interest in what they're sharing with you. Because at the end of the day, telling is not selling. Telling is not selling, all right? 70-30 rule. We have two ears and we've got one mouth. We've got to make sure that we use them proportionately in our efforts towards selling, all right? If the prospect isn't talking and sharing information with us, we're not selling. We've got to ensure that we're making the interaction about them and not about us, not about our organization, how great we are, all right? Our job is not to convince people to buy. It's not what our job is. Our job is to help them discover their own reasons for buying. All right? It's not just to give information, it's to gather information. We've got to gather information, okay? So there's all kinds of questioning strategies that we teach at Sandler. Remember, Sandler's a big, huge elephant. I went to our training center for, for every single week for 90 minutes for over three years. It takes time, it takes practice, all right? But if we look at softening and reversing, that's the one that we're gonna focus on today, softening and reversing. Well, reversing is simply answering a question with a question. So somebody could ask me a question about myself, about my business, and I could say something like, well, why do you ask? Why do you ask? Now, sometimes with answering a question with a question, sometimes that can come across as a little bit abrasive or a little bit uncomfortable so we talk about softening that first. So if somebody asks me a question, a softening statement that I could utilize is, hey, you know what, great question. Maybe you can help me understand why you asked that. Or I could say, hey, that's an interesting question. Why do you ask me that just now? All right? All kinds of different softening statements. 
another softening statement. Hey, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for bringing that up. A lot of people that I talk to bring up that same point or that same question, but they bring it up for different reasons. Why is it that you're asking me that right now? Okay. So what I want us to do is to always clarify why somebody asks, asks us a question. Clarify, clarify, clarify. If we don't know why they asked us a question, let's ask them. If we don't know what the real intent behind the question is, let's ask them, all right? Don't assume we know the reasons why they ask questions. Let's really seek to understand. So let's take a little pause here, think through 10, 20 seconds. When you are in your sales endeavors and you're talking to prospects, what questions are, you, are they consistently asking you? If anybody has one they want to share, go ahead and share it. But what questions do you know that they're going to ask you? What's that? How much are you, how much are we going to get them for? Yeah, how much are you going to charge me? Okay. Anybody else? Do you guys work weekends? Good. Can you be here early in the morning? Can you be here early in the morning? Okay. So do you guys work weekends? Hey, you know what? Thank you for asking me that right now. I'm sensing that that's important to you. You know, why is it that you want to know if we work weekends? Help me understand why that's important. Hey, thanks for asking me if we're going to be here in the morning. A lot of people ask that. Uh, you're asking for a reason though. What's the reason that you want to know that? Okay. Accepting the question, welcoming it, soften it and seek to understand why that's important rather than just jumping out and solving it. If someone says, hey, are you going to be here? Uh, do you, are you going to be here in the morning? And we say, yeah, of course we're going to be here in the morning. It opens up the door for them to say, yeah, that's what the last person said. That's what the last company said. How do I know? How do I know that you're actually going to be here? If we ask them why that's important and why they want us there, maybe they'll share with us a story about how the last person that they were working with wasn't there in the morning. And then maybe we could ask them some more questions as to how that impacted them, how that impacted their business. All right, so dummy curve is really, if you look at dummying up, it's not being dumb about our products or service, but I want you to get very, 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 very comfortable with the phrase, can you help me understand? Get very comfortable with the phrase, can you help me understand? Can you help me understand why this is important to you? Can you help me understand what you mean by X, Y, Z? Can you help me understand why you're bringing that up? Okay. Third party story is pretty simple. Third party story is really sharing a specific story of a situation that you had. That's exactly the same as the situation that you're in with this prospect, but you want to remove them from the situation. Hey, would it be okay if I shared a story with you? Or would it be okay if I shared a situation that kind of comes to mind? They're going to say, yeah, go ahead. Well, this may not be the case here, but a couple months ago, I had someone who was asking me questions about this, asking me questions about that. Ultimately, what we decided to do was this, and this is kind of what happened from there. All right. Okay. We're going to get into pain. We're going to spend the next 15 minutes, the next 10 minutes on pain, and then we'll open it up for questions. But pain is really a compelling personal, emotional reason for somebody to buy. If you think about pain, it's the gap between where they are right now and where they're trying to get to. Where are they right now and where are they trying to get to? And we got to really understand what that gap is. All right. People buy for their reasons, not our reasons. Their pain points are their reasons as to why they would buy. All right. This bottom one is basically David Sandler's most famous quote. David Sandler is the guy who founded our company back in the mid sixties. People buy emotionally. They justify their decisions intellectually. People buy emotionally. They justify their decisions intellectually. So we need to create an emotional attachment to these needs, problems, challenges that they have. All right. Sounds tricky. It's not that tricky, but there's really three levels of needs, of problems, of challenges. There's the surface level what, which they will talk about, they will be aware of. 
Then there's the reasons as to why. Why is that a problem? And then the third level is what is the impact of that problem? Think about your organizations. Think about the prospects and people that you meet with and have sales conversations with. What are some of these needs or what are sort of the, some of these problems that they bring to you? What comes to mind? Why do people come to you? Why do you have conversations with people? Think about it for five seconds and then I want to hear from people. A couple, couple examples. You had mentioned multiple needs. What are some needs, challenges, problems that people have that your organization can solve for? Dirty trucks. What's that? Dirty trucks. Dirty trucks. Okay, that's one. What else? DOT violations. DOT violations. Okay, all right. What else? Ooh, image, maintenance, morale, good. Good, good, good. These are surface level what? These are surface level problems that they're gonna bring up. Good, jot these down, be aware of them. But we need to understand through questioning with them, why is that a problem for them? Why? Why are dirty trucks a problem for you, all right? Why is you know, your image uh, uh, an issue? Like why, help me understand why. And then let's understand, okay, how is it impacting them? How is it impacting their business, okay? So we've got to move from that intellectual what down to the emotional impact. Now there's the Sandler Payne Funnel. There's eight, qu eight questions, there's a Sandler Payne Funnel. It's designed to go from the surface level what down to the intellectual, or excuse me, the surface level intellectual down to the emotional attachment, all right? Eight questions. We're going to go through these questions. Somebody shares with me. Uh oh. There we go. Somebody shares with me, hey, I've got a dirty truck, or I'm having DOT problems. If they share that, rather than jumping in and solving that problem for them and explaining why BioClean Systems is going to clean their truck more efficiently, more effectively every time. I'm asking you guys to take a deep breath and ask them, hey, can you tell me more about that? Or can you be more specific and give me an example? Can you be more specific and give me an example? Why would we want them to be more specific and give us an actual example of one of these problems that they have? What comes to mind? Why would that be beneficial for us? Go ahead. So you don't immediately fail what they're wanting. A little bit louder? So you don't Yeah, so that, so that we don't immediately fail, but really so that we can actually understand, fully understand the situation. What else? Why else would, we, would it be beneficial for them to share a specific example? What's that? See if there's other needs. Yeah, big picture, we want to see if there's other needs for sure. Good. Why else would we want a specific example that we could talk through with them? Go ahead, Adam. It builds rapport and it shows that we care and ultimately it makes these issues that they're having real. It's top of mind, hey, I just went through this. And we're gonna seek to understand further here shortly, but it's a real life situation. It's not some objective big picture thing that they're looking at. It is a real life situation that they're in. So we, yeah, okay. So we wanna say, hey, can you be more specific and give me an example? And then we wanna listen to what they share with us. All right, from there, we wanna ask them questions like this. How long has that been a problem? How long has that been a problem? What would be the benefit of asking that question? Huge, ding, ding, ding. It finds out their pain tolerance. If they say, ah, I've been dealing with this for the last 15 years. Well, are they really going to want to, to take action to actually change it? Probably not, okay? How long has this been a problem? Next question, what have you tried to do about it? What have you already tried to do about it? Why would we ask a question like that? For sure. So we definitely use that question to understand what their loyalty is. What else comes to mind? Go ahead. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Oh, no. 
well, what if they've tried to do things to solve the problem that we maybe would already, that we would suggest that they try? Then we kind of put our foot in our mouth and they could say, no, I already tried that. That doesn't work. Not interested in that. So we want to understand what have they tried to do about the problem. And then when they share with us what they've tried to do or what your competitor has tried to do, we want to ask them, well, did that work? Did that work? Did that work? Now, more often than not, if they're meeting with us, obviously it didn't work, okay? So then we get into the next question, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how much do you think this has cost you? Now, costs are not always dollars and cents. Cost could be what is their reputation within the marketplace? What is their reputation within uh, the organization? Uh, maybe their job is at stake or something along those lines. So what is the cost? Costs aren't always dollars and cents, but we want to try and get to dollars and cents eventually. All right. And then we got to ask them, how do they feel about that? How do you feel about constantly having a dirty truck that leads to a real negative image about your organization and how you care about and maintain? All right. How have you given up? And then it's, have you given up on trying to deal with the problem? So we want to take these surface level challenges, needs that they have and dig into the Sandler pain funnel to get down to the impact of how is this really hurting them, all right? So that's Sandler Payne. From there, how do you know that you've dug deep enough? How do you know that you really have problems, pains on the table? We're seeking to understand or have them share that they're frustrated. They're frustrated about this. They're concerned about not being able to get these problems solved. They're sick and tired. They're sick and tired of not having something that works, all right? They're, they're concerned, they're angry, they're worried. We're gonna sense these emotions from them or they're just gonna flat out tell us that that's the situation that they're in, all right? And then once we have all of this, we take all of this, we summarize everything that we heard, we make sure that we have the full picture, the full understanding in place, and then we ask them, okay, have you given any thought as to how much you're willing and able to invest to take care of all of these problems? And then that becomes the standard budget step, all right? And then the, through the decision step, we want to understand the people, process, and criteria. That's all that we have today. I've got five minutes left for questions. I want to open it up. Any questions that you guys have about Sandler, about the sales process, challenges that you have, uh, feel free to jump in and ask. There's got to be something out there. Yeah, so is it, is it commonplace where people jump to you right out of the gate? Hey, how much is this going to cost? Pretty much immediately. Okay, pretty much immediately. Okay, so there's a specific strategy that we'll work through right here. First of all, we want to welcome the question. We want to welcome the question. Remember those softening statements that I brought up? We don't want to have it be perceived that we're trying to dodge the question or get away from it. We want to welcome the question. And by welcoming the question, we could say something like, you know what, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Thank you for bringing that up. From there, we assure them. Welcome and then assure. We can assure them that, look, I can assure you that we're going to cover what the price is or what the cost is, all right? But before we get there, would it be okay if I asked you some questions to really fully understand the situation that you're in? Would it be okay if I asked you some questions so we welcome them? We assure them that we're gonna get there and that we're gonna talk about what the price is, but we need to ask them some questions to really understand what the full scope of the situation is so that we can provide an accurate quote and an accurate price. And then at the end of the day, so we welcome them, we welcome the question, we assure them that we're gonna get there, we ask them some questions, or if we can ask them some questions, and then we can assure them, look, I can assure you that we're, we're competitive pricing within the marketplace. I can assure you that, you know, it's, it's, it's not far off from what you're seeing. Would it be okay if we talked about some other things that are important to you before we get there? Ultimately, you're trying to pivot off of price. Is that helpful at all? Robert, yeah. Robert, let me ask you this. How, how cut and dry is it? If they come to you and they say, what's the price? How cut and dry is it? Where you know right out of the gate, hey, this is what it's going to be. How cut and dry is it? Sometimes it's just like, just like, like they're literally, you're, you're in the middle of options. The guy's like, hey, I got a lead of pinch 
And you know, so you, you know exactly what it's going to be off tops. So you could just tell them, hey, this is what it's going to be. We always have to review this lead every time we do it. So I have my skills, but I was just looking like, how do we navigate that? So if it's a situation where you know exactly what it's going to cost and they are just won't get off of price, then you could tell them. You could just, if they keep badgering you, say, hey, this is probably what it's going to be. But if it's a situation where you actually have to review the fleet and look into things, you could say something like, you know what? I'm really glad that you brought that up. Ultimately, that's what I want to get to. All right, ultimately that's what I want to get to, but quite frankly, you're on chapter 15 and I'm still on page one. So would it be okay if I asked you some questions to help make sure that we're on the same page and I have a full scope and understanding of your situation? Because when I do provide a price, I want it to be accurate. So, you know, explaining that, hey, look, it could be, I don't know, I don't know exactly what our investment level is gonna be at this point. Would it be okay if I asked you some questions to really understand what the situation is? I can assure you, that we're gonna get there. I can assure you that I wanna provide you accurate pricing, all right? But I don't really know at this point. What other questions? Ultimately, you're trying to pivot off of that price, all right? Welcome the question, assure them that they're, they're gonna get there, assure them that you're gonna get there, assure them that you're competitive within the marketplace, but you've really gotta fully understand their situation a little bit further before you can provide an accurate price. Because the last thing you want to do is provide them a number that isn't accurate. Any other questions? All right, I think Adam's going to take it away. <laughs>